Well, today we're going to conclude the sermon series that we've been working on for uh, the last several weeks, a uh, sermon series that's entitled Resolve, Aligning Yourself with God's Will. Now, the idea behind it is really simple. Every single one of us that's gathered here today, uh, we've had a time in our life, maybe several, uh, where you were at a crossroads, where you were standing at a crossroads and you had no idea which way to go. And maybe you're facing that crossroads right now, that you're standing in that moment. And the temptation that most of us have, I think, uh, is uh, to go the way that we want to go, right? Uh, to head in the direction that, that we feel led, right? The, the purpose that I want for my life. You know, you're saying to Jesus, Jesus, I'll take the wheel. I'll take it from your hands and I'll drive because I know exactly which way that I need to go. And here's the problem. Nine times out of 10, what happens is when you take the wheel uh, out of Jesus's hands and you start driving on your own direction, you end up either hopelessly lost somewhere where you didn't want to be in a ditch or worse, Right? But if you want to make sure that you 100% will be going in the direction where you should be going, then you need to be aligned with God's vision and God's will for your life. That's how you clear that up. And I know it's easy to say, right? You know, because us churchy people, we say that stuff all the time, particularly preachers. You need to be lined up with God's will for your life, right? That's my preacher voice. <laughs> Pretty good, right? So... It's easy to say it, it's more difficult to figure it out, right? That's the practical nature when the rubber hits the road. It's hard sometimes to know which way God is leading you to go, which direction that you're supposed to be heading. And so that's why we've been spending so much time over the course of these past several weeks really identifying some steps, some ways that you can first determine which way you're supposed to go to determine God's vision for your life and then step into that uh, and be able to keep going when things are difficult. Now, if you've missed any of these sermons, I highly recommend that you go back, go to our website. We have a sermon page and you can read uh, the sermon notes and listen to the sermons or watch them uh, on video. I would encourage you to do that. If you've even if you have been here um, and you're still trying to figure this out, go back and begin to listen to them again because there's some really good stuff in the midst of all that about how to figure it out. But today we're going to take that final step and we're going to be talking today about what you do in order to have a sustainable life-giving pace as you're pursuing God's will for your life in a way that will give you life and also life to the people around you. How do you keep going? How do you sustain the pace that, you're, that you are, are currently in? Uh, and, or maybe how do you sustain a pace that is doable, right? That's what uh, Beth was talking about uh, with her confession of sin. You know, having the right kind of pace. How do we do this? Uh, because if you don't have the right kind of pace, uh, then you can easily find yourself burning out. You can find yourself getting weary. Uh, and maybe even giving up. And it, may have even, and it may have a negative effect on the people around you as well. Now, <clears throat> how many of you have ever heard this phrase before? The phrase that we're going to put up here on the screen. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. H have you ever heard that phrase? Somebody has maybe said that phrase to you, right? So sometimes I've had people in my life that have said that to me, uh, and they did not have good intentions, right? Uh, they were thinking mostly of themselves and their own discomfort. Uh, and that can happen sometimes in your life as well, uh, where people will speak this to you uh, because they want you to do what? Slow down, right? They want you to slow down. They'll speak this into your life perhaps because they are upset or uncomfortable about the direction that you're heading. Uh, it has nothing maybe to do with the pace, but the direction, because here's my theory about most of us. It's like most of us are all sitting on the couch, right? And as soon as somebody gets up and decides, I'm not going to sit on the couch, I'm going to go outside and do something else, all the rest of us that are sitting on the couch, it indicts us, right? because <laughs> I don't feel like getting up off the couch, but they did, and now I feel like I need to get off the couch, but I don't want to get off the couch. And so you can quickly become angry or agitated at the person who got off the couch. And so sometimes people will say it's a sprint. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon in those moments. But here's the thing. <clears throat> I've also had people speak this into my life when I absolutely needed to hear it because I was going at a pace that was not sustainable. 
And when they said, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, it really and truly was speaking truth into my life, a truth that I needed to hear. Now, um, I know what many of you were thinking when you walked in today, uh, you know, you were thinking that this looks like a guy who could run some marathons. <laughs> That's what y'all were thinking, I know. <laughs> you were not thinking that. that. That entered into no one's mind, right? Uh, and, and there's some truth in that because I do not like to run, okay? Um, now, I will run. You might see me running at the gym on the treadmill, if you're lucky, because it will be beautiful. <laughs> but if you see me running in the neighborhood, then you know two things. I am being chased, <laughs> and I need your help. <laughs> so help me, right? So I don't like to run, but I know lots of people that love to run, and they tell me things about running uh, that sound foreign to me, uh, but yet um, I kind of get it, right? Uh, so people will say that there's a moment when you're running that after you get past a certain stage, like if you get past like a couple of miles, maybe three miles or so, <laughs> why, why, right? But they would run for like that length, and then all of a sudden euphoria comes over you, and you get what's called a runner's what? A runner's high, right? And then suddenly you feel like you could run forever. I can tell you with all honesty, that has never happened to me. <laughs> I'm just not patient enough. If the runner's high happened two seconds into my run, man, I'd be a runner. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's like two or three miles in. And so I usually give up before that time, right? But, you know, when you talk about running marathons, one of the things that people will say is, like, if you can just get through that first two or three miles and you have a good pace through that first two or three miles and you get to that runner's high, you get to that moment where the tipping point happens, then suddenly everything changes, right? But if you use all your energy in those first two or three miles that you take off in a marathon, if you take off as a sprint then you're probably not going to get to that point, will you? And you eventually will end up collapsing because you've used all your energy on the front end and you've saved nothing for later. Now, unless you're uh, Jeffrey Matai, uh, this guy is, uh, has run the fastest marathon in the history of human beings. Um, he runs a marathon uh, with a 4.41 minute mile. <laughs> Okay, so that's not normal, <laughs> right? Because he's running at a sprint, at least for most of us, what would be a sprint from the moment he begins until he ends, right? Uh, but for the rest of us, for regular human beings, we can't run like that. We can't sustain that kind of pace without falling apart. And the same is true in your life when you are trying to pursue God's will and God's vision. You may have the vision clearly in your mind of where you want to go, where God is calling you. All the desires and the passions of your heart are beating uh, just to do what God wants you to do. But if you take off and you are heading towards that goal and that vision, and you're using up all of your energy and all of your passion at the very front end, uh, there will be consequences. And so this is what we're talking about today, how to maintain that pace, how to, how to figure out what's sustainable. And we're going to be using as our conversation partner, Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah is from the Hebrew scriptures, and he wrote a memoir about how he pursued God's will and God's vision with all of his heart. And he ran again, he came up against uh, the reality that the pace that he had established was unsustainable when he was working to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Here's what I want us to hold on to and remember today. If you want to build great things, you need to consider the cost. That's what Nehemiah was really and truly struggling with, that there was a, pay, there was a pace that he needed to consider. There was a cost that came with that pace as he was trying desperately to finish and to achieve the goal that had been put on his heart. And so we're going to be taking a look at Nehemiah chapter 5. I want to do a very brief uh, recap. Uh, Nehemiah was the, uh, the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, a Persian king. The Persian Empire was the big boy on the block at that particular time when it came to empires in the ancient world. 
Um, but generations earlier, the reason why Nehemiah was in the position that he was in, uh, because he was of Hebrew descent, uh, and generations earlier, uh, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, had been brought to that region uh, by Nebuchadnezzar, the great Babylonian king who destroyed Jerusalem, raised the city walls, uh, and by raised, I mean R-A-Z, not raised. Uh, he destroyed them, uh, and uh, he also destroyed the temple and took a whole bunch of Jewish people back to Babylon to assimilate them into Babylonian culture, and basically they lived there as captives for several generations. Now, the Persians began to send people back to their homelands where they could begin to thrive and where they would have uh, a foothold in all of these different areas. Uh, and so these people would then pay tribute or pay taxes. And so that's what happened. A lot of the Hebrew people went back to Jerusalem, but the walls were not able to be rebuilt. Uh, they would not allow that. The Persians didn't allow them to do that. So Nehemiah has a burden to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem because it was a sign and symbol of a broken relationship with God. In the ancient world, that's what that meant. When your walls of your city were torn down and left uh, desolate, that meant in the ancient world that your God had abandoned you. Nehemiah didn't believe that God had abandoned his people, but he wanted to instill that uh, image and instill that into their hearts and to show them, and that was why he wanted the walls to be healed, to be rebuilt. But on his way to getting this done, some stuff starts happening, right? First of all, he had some opposition, but then even after he overcomes that opposition, the pace that he was keeping was not sustainable. And it began to show up in some interesting ways. And the people came to him and basically said, this is what's happening as a result of what you are having us do, of this pace that you are having us keep. And so this is what we find in Nehemiah chapter five. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Now, these are the people that are working on the wall. Okay, and so in the next passage. Still others were saying we've had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews and through our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. So what was going on is these people were having to abandon their life, right? Abandon their work uh, as they were, uh, they basically had sustenance living in a lot of cases. They were not able to farm. They were not able to do the things uh, that they needed to do in order to have uh, food, in order to have sustenance, to make a living uh, because they were working on the wall uh, at a desperate pace. And so in order for them to have food, they were having to use money that they had. And then when they ran out of the money, they had to mortgage whatever they had in terms of vineyards or their property, uh, farms, and so forth. And then there were others who were also having to then uh, sell their children into slavery, uh, into indentured servitude, essentially. Uh, so they would, they would have uh, money given to them that they would then have to pay back. Uh, if they were able, they were going to get their children back. So Nehemiah is confronted with this and realizes that his pace has an unintended result, which is the people are now desperate. And so this is what happens. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind, okay? And then he begins, he does a couple of things, right? Um, he begins to realize that there's some problems that have arisen because of all of this stuff, and there's problems with the officials and the nobles uh, that are Jewish as well, and he accuses them, you are charging your own people interests. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have brought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, okay, let's, let's hold on to that for just a second. So here's, here's what he's doing now, is he's basically saying to these guys, you're going to have to make this right. You're going to have to take care of this. 
And so what he demands of all of these nobles and officials is that they basically have to give back all the things that they've taken. He declares a jubilee where all debts are canceled, where those who are enslaved are set free, um, where uh, anybody who made money off of interest now has to pay the interest back to the people that they made the money off of interest. And uh, if any property was foreclosed upon, it has to be returned to its original owners. And so Nehemiah knows that there's things that have to be made right in the midst of all of this work that's being done, that he can't neglect the people who are crying out to him. But he also realizes that there's something about him. If he wants to be the kind of person that God wants him to be, if he wants to be a person that is a person of integrity and justice and mercy, even on his way to this goal of achieving what God wanted him to do, he can't neglect uh, his own soul. And so this is what he says. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All of my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. So basically, he says, I'm not going to, uh, to make an undue demand on these people like the previous governors did. I'm going to be a person of integrity, and I'm not going to make them starve to death uh, because of me, right? So uh, all of this stuff is working on Nehemiah while he's continuing uh, to stay uh, focused on getting the walls rebuilt. It doesn't mean that he abandoned it. It doesn't mean that he quit. He just changed a little bit of his course. He changed his pace just a tad in order to take care of the people that were being affected by his pace and also to tend to himself as well. So this is what Nehemiah basically learned. He realized that there were unintended results from pursuing his goal, and he needed to consider the cost on the people and on himself, I would add. So what do we do? from this story. I mean, like, what do we take away from this? Like, how do we learn from what Nehemiah learned all those many, many, many years ago? Well, I think that it comes down to us considering some things, considering the cost of our pace, considering the cost of the uh, sort of uh, way that we're heading into this, right? And so I know that you're going to be surprised, but I have three things that you need to consider. And the first one is this. Consider the cost to yourself. So it's implied in there that Nehemiah had to consider that. He had to figure that out. Um, and, and this is what a lot of us, uh, you know, we don't do, right? We don't take a hard look like Nehemiah had to do at ourselves. And, and where we're located in this whole thing is I'm driving and moving forward, uh, pursuing the good, right? Pursuing God's will for my life. What I think that God uh, wants me to do. Um, sometimes you can neglect your own soul and your own heart, right? And this is what I would call the 30,000 foot rule. So if you're ever on an airplane... Right? And they always tell you that when the, the oxygen mask falls, uh, that if you have somebody with you, like a child or someone who can't take care of themselves, uh, then what are you supposed to do? You put it on yourself first, right? It's not our instinct to do that, right? It's our instinct to take care of other people. It's our instinct to worry about others, right? Uh, but if you do that, if you decide that you're going to take the mask and try to fiddle with it and put it on someone else, you run the risk of both of you perishing, right? So put it on yourself first and then tend to the people around you as needed, right? And so that's an important thing for us to remember, that when we're deciding, I'm going to pursue God's will for my life, that the pace that I'm on needs to include some self-care for me. Otherwise, I'm going to use up all of my energy, all of my passion, all of it in those first two or three miles. I'm never going to get to the place where I'm going to feel like I can run forever. Now, I don't know what it is for you, um, but I can only speak to my own sort of journey and my story about how this works for me. Uh, and this is after a long time, a lot of years of getting it wrong. So I spend time every single day uh, in the morning. Now, for me, it's in the morning, but I have to have some solitude. I've got to read. I've got to think. I've got to pray. I've got to write. Um, and, and I have to be, you know, somewhat alone. You know, I've got to do that kind of in solitude. That's just my thing. But then I also need to spend time with my wife, and we do that. We have 
carved out time where uh, we will have prayer together. Uh, we will talk about what's going on in our lives. We'll spend some time maybe even thinking about scripture. Uh, and that's just important to us. So that tends my soul. I also see a counselor every week. There is no shame in that. Right? I'm just telling y'all that I do. You should be glad your pastor sees a counselor every week. <laughs> And I know some people, they don't want to talk about that stuff in church, right? They don't want to admit uh, that they, they're seeing a therapist, that they need, they're seeing a count. Listen, we got to give that up, y'all. Can I get a witness, right? I mean, I recommend it to everybody. You need somebody in your life that you can speak to that professionally understands how to help you reshape your narrative and figure that stuff out. That is not your friend, that's not your spouse, that's not a coworker. You need somebody in your life that can speak that into you. And so I would encourage you to do that. That's my, that is my journey. I do that. I also take classes and I'm taking an Enneagram class. I mean, I, I go to conferences. I try to do all that stuff. And guess what? I don't have time for any of this. I don't. But I know what it's like to be on the other side of it when I've decided that I didn't have time and I didn't do it. Because I have found myself emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically dry and falling apart. And trust me, that is no good for anybody, right? So that's why it's important for us to tend to our souls, to tend uh, to our connection to God and to do that uh, for ourselves. Consider the cost to ourselves. Second, consider the cost to your family. Now, I'm going to say this. This is really important, and you need to hear this. It's very, 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 very true, okay? So if the thing that you're pursuing, if the good that you are pursuing is causing you to lose your family, I would humbly suggest that that is not God's vision, okay? Because it's not God's vision for you to lose your family at the expense of something that you are passionate about. And it's easy to do, isn't it? Because you get excited and you want to pursue God's will. You want to head off in that direction. It consumes you. It consumes your time. And before you know it, suddenly you are losing out on time and, uh, with your kids. And you're starting to lose connections with them. And you may lose connections with your spouse. Uh, and it could send your marriage down the tubes. I've had people who have come in my office and who have said, I can't believe uh, that this happened to me, right? That their marriage fell apart, that their kids can't stand them. Uh, I can't believe this happened to me because I was only trying to do God's will. Why did God let this happen? And I always tell them, God didn't let that happen. You did. You let it happen because you became so consumed with doing the good that you forgot that there were other people on the journey with you. And you have to make sure that your family is on board when you are moving in the direction to follow God's will. And they may not get on board right away. They may not get that. And if that's the case, you can't run off and leave them. You have to go at a pace where they can go with you. Before I moved here, before I even decided you know, whether uh, it, you know, this was where God was calling me, one of the things that we had to do as a family was to have a conversation with my whole family to see where everybody was. And I, I just decided if there's one member of the family other than Jacob, because he didn't get a vote. <laughs> <laughs> he was six. He don't care. I mean, you know, he just, as long as it was P. Terry's, I mean, he was like, yes, this is the greatest place in the world, right? <laughs> But I, everybody needed to be on board. That was, that was my thing. I said, everyone in my family's got to be on board. Otherwise, I know that this is not where I'm supposed to go. And my mom was kind of the sticking point for me because my mom was not well. And I went to my mom and I said, listen, here's the deal. Um, I think God is calling us to move to Austin. And I, I, I fully expected for her to say, I don't think that I'm going to be able to go. And she said to me, Let's go. I want one more adventure. Come on. That's when you know that your family is with you, right? But if they're not with you, then maybe you need to slow your pace just a tad. All right, the third one. Consider the cost to others. So if you are moving in a particular direction in your life, you're heading towards God's vision, right? And you start to see all the people in your life, your friends, your coworkers, your colleagues, the people in your church, you know, all those things. If you see them as a supporting cast for you, stepping stones on your way to something, 
You're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. Because here's the thing, you can get so far out in front of the people in your life, your friends, your coworkers, colleagues, your church, fellow church members, you can get so far out in front of them that suddenly you look around and you realize that you are all by yourself because you didn't think that you needed anyone. That is the American narrative, isn't it? That cultural narrative of the rugged individual who pulls themselves up by their bootstraps, who accomplish things on their own. Let me tell you something, y'all. I'm about to preach right up in here, okay? I know we're going over. Stop looking at your watch. (laughs) Every single one of those stories was not about an individual. They might have been the leader, they might have been the one that got their name in the paper, but they were not alone. They did not accomplish it on their own, by themselves. They had a village of people that were around them because anybody that is a good leader, a great uh, person who is able to step above the fray and be able to move forward, they move forward with people with them, right? And so, you know, you need to be able to see that your colleagues, your friends, your coworkers, they're there to move with you, not for you to get so out, far out in front of them that you leave them behind. That's when you know you're doing it wrong. Your pace is not right. Jesus showed us over and over again uh, how important community was, and he had to be patient sometimes with his disciples and tell them the same thing over and over and over and over again and do the same things over and over and over again. In fact, one time he even prayed to God. Jesus got frustrated and said, God, how long do I have to put up with these people? <laughs> That's real comforting to me uh, uh, to see Jesus do that, right? Because sometimes people struggle uh, to come with you, and then you need to have patience with them because, you know, there are going to be people, listen, there are going to be people that you might leave behind, all right? But there will be other people that will come with you. So that's so important. Those three things to consider. If you begin to consider those things as you're moving in the direction that God wants you to move, then you will discover something incredible. You will discover that you will hit that tipping point where it feels like you can run forever in the right direction. And that is so important for us to remember because we need to do this. We need to to remember that if we want to build great things that we're going to have to consider the cost. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we are humbled and grateful to gather here today in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And God, we know that we gather in the presence of a risen Savior that moves among us, that is constantly doing new things, calling us uh, to new directions. And Lord, I pray that we would be the people uh, who not only see clearly where we are being called, but that we would be able to sustain that pace and to be able to bring others with us. And God, uh, that we would do this uh, with great joy and great passion. And Lord, at, not at the greatest cost to our own hearts and our own spirits, but God, that this would give us life and meaning and purpose. And we pray all these things in the name of your Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy King.